so the aim of this uh, session is for Oxfam to be able to give, a, give us an overview of um, their program data story, also to help um, others uh, see where they're at and uh, help also lead to different reflections on the question of program data for, for Francophone NGOs. So I'll hand over to, to Rick uh, straight away so that he can start. Don't hesitate. Uh, there'll be different moments when you can ask uh, questions. And the idea is really to for us to be able to exchange as much as possible. If you feel more comfortable asking your questions in French, um, don't hesitate. And we'll find a way of, uh, of translating. And we'll have uh, Marion also, who will be monitoring the, the chat um, if you want to put questions uh, along the way. So over to you, Rick, and hope we everybody hears you OK or, or let us know through the chat. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, nice to, to be invited to speak on this session. Hopefully, you can hear me OK there in the room and, and online. Um, it's a shame I can't actually be there with you all physically, um, which was the original plan. Um, but thanks to the joys of COVID, uh, it didn't quite work out. But um, so hopefully we can sort of, yeah, have an interesting discussion still during this session. Um, so as an introduction, my name is Rick Tai. I work for Oxfam GB. Um, I'm working the digital and programs team within Oxfam, which is a, a relatively small team, but I appreciate having this kind of team at all, um, kind of is a, is a bonus for us. Um, we're a team of six who work with our country programs to deliver or help support technology implementations, and that mainly covers mobile data collection or surveys, um, also digital registration of program participants, distribution tracking. Um, we work on GIS implementations. And then also over the last few years, we've been getting more and more involved in helping manage and then analyze the data that's being collected. So that's sort of broadly, and we all have different specialisms, but broadly anyone in the team can kind of pick up different aspects. Um, and we support in theory around sort of 40 to 50 countries. Um, we could, thankfully they don't all need help at any one time. Um, and most of our work is driven by country need. So we are an advisory team. Um, we're spread out around the world, um, but most of our work comes from demand from country programs. Um, so I shall start just with a bit of a, a kind of timeline, really just to show you. So I've been part of this team for around six years now. Um, and this has not been a quick process to kind of build up the use of these kinds of digital tools in our country programs and this use of data. So I guess the first main initiative that we had was back in 2014, where we created the mobile survey toolkit. So this was a couple of colleagues of mine, Emily and Laura, um, who spent some time at this point, there were probably, uh, so in 2013, maybe 15 or 20 different survey tools being used across Oxfam, um, which meant it was very disjointed. There was no common support available um, and uh, different costs, different pricings. So what they did was a, a kind of scan of the market, tried to figure out what the key elements were um, and really narrowed it down to two tools. So we went from, let's say between 15 and 20, sort of stand, uh, tools being used down to a recommended two. Um, and I say, we are still advisory function. We can't enforce this. We can't tell people they have to use certain tools. Um, as you'll see uh, on a later slide, we have, over time managed to grow the use of these sort of standard elements rather than people just using um you know whichever tool they happen to be aware of or or know about 
So we designed the mobile survey toolkit and this helped assign particular tools, but it also helped, there was guidance on how to do mobile data collection, how to do it well, how to do it safely and securely. So that was a big first step. And we started slowly bringing country teams into using these, these two tools, Survey CTO and Movenzi. The next sort of big step was creating our responsible data training pack in 2015. Um, and this was an acknowledgement that it's not just about collecting data. Um, we need to do it safely and responsibly. Um, and this was, we had a, a responsible data policy was created, um, but we wanted to make sure this wasn't just, you know, a, a policy document being written and left on the shelf. So we designed the training pack or, along with between our team, our IT and our um, uh, protection team in humanitarian. And this focused on, again, how to collect data securely, how to use it safely, and then how to dispose of it. So often an element we sort of forget about. We've then moved on. In 2016, we focused on, we now had some standard tools for uh, mobile surveys. We started looking at digital registration systems and we um, piloted some tools. Actually, I guess sort of 2016, 2017, with the e-voucher and cash tools, probably linked. Um, <clears throat> and we settled on some tools like LMMS and Red Rose. Again, we're just trying to have some standard systems out there that we could we could support as a team that we knew were well supported by a, um, a vendor, by a supplier. And we could obviously negotiate pricing structures and support structures along with that, that benefited the countries. So we were slowly been building this journey of having some standard tools that we can use um, for our data collection activities. We also then started in 2017, the idea of having a survey bank. So for use across both our standard data collection tools, um, a series of <coughs> say our 48 hour toolkit for humanitarian response. So standard tools that you can pick up off the shelf and go with teams don't have to design them every time from, from the start. Um, that's one of those things, these initiatives that has, it still exists. It's not been the best used solution, I have to say. Um, and it's partly been because we as a team don't we don't own the content of these tools. So we've, we've always offered to help design and build them within the data collection tools, but we are not the content owners. That is our livelihoods team or our wash team. Um, and for certain tools, it's combinations of the two um, and trying to, to kind of manage that and get everyone to agree on these are the set questions that need to be asked in these ways has sometimes proved difficult. And I think for me, that's a probably a running theme through this session is the technology is the easy bit. With any of these tools, with data collection and data analysis, the technology is usually relatively straightforward. It's getting people working together, agreeing on things, that's where it gets tricky. Um, so let's say, from kind of 2014, 15 and 16, we've had a lot of these standard tools in place. So what we've since been doing is innovating around the use of those tools. And one of the big ones for us in 2017, we developed a feedback and accountability mechanism, both process and technology using Survey CTO for case management. Um, and this was one of the tools where we we as a team had more control over the, the survey structure and design. And we could start getting more standardized data across different country programs. Um, so probably 90% of the survey is common across all the countries that are now using this. And so we can start pulling out some common themes and, and common pieces of data. Um, and that's 
become very valuable for us in showing what is possible out there. Um, so it's, it's more looking at processes and, and ways of working. Um, there we go. Um, we've then, and I'll come on and talk in more detail in a moment about our data hub, but this was a way about of, again, managing data, making it available for country programs. And as well as these, technical pieces looking at tools or you know selecting tools or using those tools we also maintain a research element to our work um, so for example in 2018 we did a piece of research around biometrics particularly in the humanitarian sector um, and so again it's just trying to keep that link between it's not just about collecting data it's how we do it why we do it um, and who we're doing it for. And I guess my timeline kind of stops at 2018, partly because of what I could get on a slide and hopefully have it still readable for you all. But really, since that point, a lot of our work has been about trying to consolidate and expand use of existing elements. So not constantly trying to bring new things into the organization, but say, okay, we've got a good base. And how can we now build on this? Um, now, I am stealing something here from uh, from the Carter and Jade team, so from their study. Um, and this was in the recent study. There was just some ex sort of, let's say, classifications of how organizations relate to information management. And for me, as I sort of picked this up and I was looking through it, I felt there were elements here we'd, as a team and as an organization over kind of the last six, seven years, we've done a mixture of these things. So for example, the organic growth of initiatives, that's definitely, we've had organic growth of take up of these systems over time. We've also used IM for very specific purposes. So for example, the feedback and accountability mechanism has been a very specific example. We've got some restricted funding. We designed them, set something in motion, which had a, a very core reporting and uh, information management element. Um, we do kind of have some transformation plans that sit kind of in the background. Um, but we're not very good at doing the top-down stuff. Um, and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. So the plans are always there, but we're trying to work sort of slowly through and, and do the kind of ad hoc improvements and try and try and make it a pull method. We want country teams to want to use these tools, to want to use these processes, rather than us um, kind of pushing them from the top down, particularly. So just trying to as I say this was linking with Carter and Jay's work and I kind of felt we've done a mixture of a lot of these different pieces and equally there are sometimes moments where we don't necessarily use IM certainly not to the best of its abilities um, but it's it is improving and, and we're getting closer um, so that's as I say just a bit of background on kind of where we're at, how we've got there um, as a team. And then just to show the kind of where these standard tools are being used. So, so in 2016, we, we started very small, just with a few locations using these tools. And we started from that small footprint and it has grown kind of organically. So over the last few years, it slowly picked up. And in some instances, particular tools, so say survey CTO, have been implemented to meet a particular programmatic need. So like our your word counts, which is our feedback mechanism. So if a country wanted that mechanism, they had to have one of our standard tools. But in most cases, these tools have been requested for use by country teams um, rather than being sort of pushed from a headquarters perspective and i guess we've probably reached 
our kind of current peak, sort of towards the end of 2020. This year has very much just been one of kind of consolidation with all things going on in the world. We haven't really pushed to expand things. You know, here in the UK, we've had furlough schemes, teams have been reduced. Um, so it's been trying to kind of keep up with supporting existing countries rather than trying to expand anything. Um, but this is, as I say, going from 2016 with just sort of three or four countries using a core set of tools. We're now kind of over 30 countries um, with these standard tools and in a lot of places using some of our standard methodologies. So that's, yeah, as I say, where we're at, where we've got to. Um, as I say, if we'll come, there'll be a couple of sections during this presentation where we'll, there'll be a bit more interactions some questions. For those who have joined remotely, feel free to use the chat window at any point to ask questions. Um, and I can either try and answer them as we go, or I'll say we'll save them up for those kind of question and answer pieces throughout. So having talked about where we've got tools in use, and we spent, looking at that timeline, quite a few years focused on getting people using particular tools. Um, we then hit an issue of people had, we'd been successful, people had started using these tools, and we started to have a lot of data collected digitally. Um, but it was now suddenly in very different systems. And we had pieces of information um, in, say, survey CTO with our post distribution monitoring. We had perhaps LMMS with some participant data. There's always something in Excel, no matter where you are. Um, and it was very fragmented and it was time consuming to, to piece this together. Um, and there was a sort of gap sat in the middle. And usually there is some poor soul, or, or maybe if you're very lucky, a, a small team, whose job it is to try and make sense of this sitting within your monitoring and evaluation function. Um, and this is usually done from my experience, you know, with Excel, you're pulling data out of these systems manually, you're trying to clean it up, aggregate the data, you know, you're copying and pasting columns or rows, and then you're presenting it back to people again in Excel. Um, there's little thought of common coding and sort of standards of data, and there's actually quite a lot of risk um, involved because, you know, particularly where we're talking participant data, this is either being emailed across, it's being moved across between different Excel sheets. There is a risk to those people whose data we're um, we're capturing and using. So what we wanted to do, and this is where our the sort of data hub idea came into being, was that where possible, we wanted to automate these processes. So still use different systems because they're all designed for particular purposes. So we don't want to replace the data capture elements and country teams are used to using them. But where possible, automate the extraction of that data into common databases. Um, and so that our meal teams and our program managers could actually more easily access that data and then spend their time doing the analysis and doing you know, work with that data rather than spending time sorting out the data. Um, and we could also build in privacy here. So we would reduce the amount of um, manual work and we could also sort of keep this data a bit more secure. So this was the, the kind of theory we had, the idea. And what we did as a first step was build I say, a version one. So we picked one of our most popular tools, most commonly used tools, which was Survey CTO. Um, we used existing connections that they had, um, similar to APIs. 
we set up some databases within our uh, within the Oxfam environment. And so we started pushing data from Survey CTO to our very simple little data hub, um, which was just a series of databases, one per country, um, and a simple privacy wrapper. So it would remove things like people's names, addresses. So it would anonymize the data or pseudonymize the data ready for reporting. And then we used Power BI to do our you know, nice colorful dashboards and reports. Um, and so that was our kind of first step to show what was possible to take away these manual steps that, that our country teams were, were involved with. And that's now in use or has been used in around 20 countries. And we've had over, I think now just 350,000 submissions records um, put through that system. So it's been kind of for something very simple, very little development on our side. It's been mainly using existing technologies. Um, it, it's been used, it's keeping participants' data more safe and secure, and it frees our teams up to do a bit more of the, um, the actual analysis work and use this data. And this is, I guess, three different examples of how the tool, these tools are being used. So um, down the bottom here, um, and maybe if there's time later in the session, I can we'll come out of the PowerPoint mode and I can show you how some of these reports actually look uh, sort of real time. Um, but down the bottom, we've used these tools for doing um, activity tracking. So in a, say, humanitarian response, we set up a simple survey that allows, and this was mainly partners who were doing the delivery work, so kind of once a week or once every two weeks, submit their data on what activities had been carried out. And then that was with Survey CTO, with the Data Hub, aggregating that data and Power BI for the reporting. This is what we came up with, so our team. Um, and actually this was shown in the uh, the reception, like uh, the entrance when everyone came into the office in Palu, in Indonesia, in the morning, this was up on a screen. So as people were there through the emergency response, as you walked in, you could see what was going on. And I think this was a really powerful tool, um, particularly for management to have access to this kind of information real time or close to real time, but also for the teams themselves. I think we often, we know what's happening in our piece, particularly in the kind of the crazy world of a, a response. Um, so the WASH team know what they're doing and the livelihoods team know what they're doing, but to get that bigger picture, I think was was really useful um, and really important. And we've, we've used this in a, a few other responses since. Um, on the left hand side, we've got some information from our feedback dashboard. Um, so say this is in use in a number of different countries and it's around collecting feedback from communities. So we use case management so people can give us, you know, tell us what's wrong, you know, issues they have with our program. We can, uh, we create a ticket, we assign it to a particular team, maybe our wash team, they resolve the issue and we feed back to the community on what has been done. So it's it's processes that existed already, but we're trying to, um, by using digital tools and by standardizing process and data, um, we can make this more visible to everyone, to us, our partners and the communities. And then the, the last one um, is a piece that came up has particularly come to the fore during COVID uh, pandemic of working with country teams on, on perceptions. So it, we first trialed this out during a cholera response and it was working with, with communities to understand, you know, what information or misinformation is, is flowing around. Um, and, you know, where are people being directed to um, for for further information or 
simple responses. Um, and again, it, it's using simple tools, but trying to standardize so we can start looking across multiple countries. Um, in the past, we've often, one of the biggest issues we've had is that we do common delivery in different countries. The way we collect data on those and report on those is in just, yeah, every country has a different way of doing it. So some of these tools have been a way of trying to show, look, if we do standardize, and if we do fix, let's say 80% of the questions, you can still contextualize to an extent. Um, but it starts allowing you to get this bigger picture on what's going on across our programming. So that's a kind of overview of, of what we've done broadly across the globe, uh, the scale. And actually, I think we've now got the first of our polls coming up, which is to find out from you which, which tools some of you are, are using. It's always useful to know what else is out there. Uh, in the market and available. Um, so I don't know if that has popped up for anyone yet. So I think hopefully for those who have joined online, there should be a, a poll available for you to select. So this is, you know, which tools are you using? And this was me kind of scanning through ones I'm aware of and know across the sector. Um, um, what we can do is take a show of hands for the, the people who are who are here to add to the, the poll. <laughs> so could I have a show of hands uh, for we have like um yeah uh, about 10, 15 people here. A uh, show of hands for those who use uh, Kobo. So the question is really not have you heard of, but do you use Kobo? So we have uh, five. Um, those three from the same Yeah, sorry. Okay, one representative per organization. <laughs> and so who uses uh, Survey CTO? We have two, three, three and a half. <laughs> Uh, who uses uh, Mobenzi? Zero. Who uses Comcare? Uh, two. <laughs> who uses ODK? Okay, there are discussions ongoing. <laughs> We have one one organization, let's say, using ODK. Uh, who's using LMS? Okay, you're trying to transition out of ODK. I need to get back on you, back to you on. <laughs> uh, so, who uses LMS? No one. No one. I'm not sure. Okay, who uses Red Rose? Two, two using Red Rose. And anybody using bespoke uh, solutions, meaning um, solutions that uh, you built yourself? <laughs> what? Okay, we solutions that you've uh, built specifically for your need. Well, I would say yes for Teldism. I mean, yes. Yeah. We have Vitamin stuff, but that's not new. Uh, yeah, but I think we can still count it for. <laughs> okay, so one, two, three, four with MDM. Okay, four bespoke. Now, <laughs> um, what are the results online? <laughs> so, uh, so online, it's like six out of seven uh, voters bespoke. Uh, one out of seven uh, some cat. Two out of seven Olivia, one out of seven Red Rose, and one out of seven other. And which is like the flow of friends very quickly. Okay. <laughs> Knowing this is not very uh, representative in terms of a survey, but uh, it gives us a, an idea. I don't know if Rick, you want to react on that? Yeah, I think so. I think what's interesting, and I can 
hopefully share the results um, with those online of, of the answers that came through. Um, and I know there was a comment on ACFO flow, which is definitely one I need to add to this poll for when I saw a run again. Um, I think for me, it would be interesting for those who've answered is, you know, for those who've selected Kobo, you know, is it just Kobo? Or are people using multiple systems? I say, I know we've, in our country programs, we've got Survey CTO, we've got Mabenzi, we've got Kobo, kind of all in use across different programs. Um, as much as I would like us to have a single solution, um, it makes it much easier for us to support. Um, I think there's a benefit in having a, a breadth of tools available for countries. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just partly a question back out to the those online and the group is, you know, are you using a mixture of tools or are you quite well decided on a, a particular one that you use? I think there are different situations. So you have some people that don't have any official organizational tool or tools. And more so, I would say that do, at least in the room, am I <laughs> Doing a good summary, guys. <laughs> yeah, so more or less, um, I'd say majority of organizations that have a number of tools um, officially in use. Mm -hmm. And some organizations reassessing or assessing the, the tools that they're, they're using. Fair enough. I mean, we go through that same process as well. So next year we have to sort of retender for a number of these tools. Um, and it's one of those things we, we have to do it to meet procurement rules and, and show we're revisiting the marketplace. But it is also a useful exercise, obviously, in just sense checking, you know, what tools are out there. Um, I mean, I think there was obviously Kobo was a, a kind of big one. Um, I know there's mention um on the chat on the zoom call from water aid around using m water um and there's definitely an element of you know the kind of free open source tools um are very popular for very good reasons um so uh yeah i say for me it's just useful to know what you know are there any tools we've missed and, and what other tools are are in use out there in the world so thank you for that we also forgot to put on a, I would say, in the list. <laughs> yes. Or useful. In fact, I'm going to make note of. But that that's probably one or, one or two organizations. Um, I don't know if others that are remote want to add to that in the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, what I'm going to move on to look at now is a particular case study, a particular use case that we picked up. So in our work around the, the data hub and having set this up for use um, with, um, with Service CTO and with Power BI, we knew we needed anything further that we developed um, and including our use cases with this had to be grounded in a program reality um and we wanted some you know lived real examples and we knew we could maybe, do this with maybe rick uh, just to see if there are any questions before yeah. you you switch to the the case yeah, yeah. study or any reactions to start off with either from people remote or here yeah um do you want to um, Do you want to come closer to the mic? <laughs> we have a question from um, Doctors of the World. So nice way of visualizing. <laughs> um, so this data hub thing, which is very interesting. So is the data all centralized in the same place? Like, is it like a data warehouse that contains all the data from all the countries? Or is it like each country or mission has its data stored in a different place? Um, so yeah, it, it's it is a very simple version of a data warehouse, ostensibly. Um, so it's yeah, it, it's stored centrally in the cloud. 
So we use Microsoft Azure. Um, obviously, you could be using AWS or, or any other. Um, so it's stored centrally, but we do keep separate databases um, per country in there just to keep a separation of data, a segregation of data. So it makes it a little bit easier for us just to allow you know the Iraq team to see their data and Syria to see theirs. Um, but yeah, that's how it was set up originally. Right. And so and so the data is collected on Service City and it goes straight on the on Microsoft Azure. Like there is no data entry uh step or anything. It goes straight from collection to I guess it's interesting. Yeah, so it goes straight from Survey CTO. So we use their webhooks. It, as soon as a survey response comes in, it gets pushed across to Azure. I say the only thing, there is a small step it runs through. So the only bit we developed, the only bit of coding we did was this simple um, web application which scans the data, basically looks at the column titles of the data that's coming in. And if it sees a column called, I say name, first name, family name, something like that, it anonymizes that the, the data in that field. Because obviously that data is useful for the program activities. But when you get to kind of aggregate reporting, we don't like we actively don't want names, addresses, phone numbers you know, account numbers, if we're doing certain cash programs, we don't want that data in there. So we, yeah, we anonymize that information. Um, we purposefully didn't choose, what we could have done was remove that, remove those columns. So they didn't pass through to the data hub. Um, we made a conscious choice to let the, the columns go through, but with basically blank fields so that we could see which countries were trying to push data that they probably shouldn't. So with Survey CTO, we can choose with every survey which fields from that survey are published like, across to our data hub. Um, and through all of this, when we do training, there's a big element of training on responsible data practices. And one of the things you know we try and instill in country teams is not, you know, don't send reporting stuff you don't need to um so i mean don't collect it in the first place if you don't need it then don't send it for reporting if you don't need to but then we do have some kind of further checks down the line as say and it helps us see which country are sending stuff that they don't need to and then we can have a follow-up conversation with them so very interesting and and so the anonymization phase when you trim all the phone and uh, the phone numbers and the names. So it's based on the column names, I guess. So what if like a country they name a they name a variable with a weird name, like it's a name that they, they call it like something completely different. So that would like pass through the system or yes. So at the minute, as I say it's a very simple system. It is purely based on on names um, and a list that you know, we initially came up with a core set and we yeah. applied it in a number of different languages as well. Um, but, and we have expanded it over time as we've seen elements come through. Equally, we do have other, almost like gatekeeper steps in the process um, where we can remove the data further down the line. Um, like we can make sure it doesn't, you know, for the, we do more training with those who build the reports in Power BI. For example, to even though that data is there, you know, doesn't mean you need to use it. Um, but it is quite a, a simple process, and I'll perhaps when we come onto the case study, discuss a little bit more on what we had hoped to do with this. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great system, and 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 the the poor BI dashboards are built by the field teams, not by you in at H H yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. It's a mixture. Sometimes, you know, we help out and maybe um, create a first version. Um, but part of our, you know, we always train the teams in country on how to maintain and then they they can build future ones themselves. I see. Thank you very much.
Thanks. Then we have a question from Solidarity International. Yeah, hi, Rick. Uh, this is Lorraine from Solidarity. Um, I was wondering about the process that you took. Um, was it more of a, like, we ask all countries to kind of send our data, or uh, did you have, did you kind of map it beforehand um, and provide guidelines to the to country teams, I think? We're kind of in the middle of this ourselves, and so any insight uh, would be valuable. So with the data hub, we initially started it off directly linked with our, our feedback mechanism. So this Your Word Counts project. Um, so we got some restricted funding for the feedback mechanism. And as part of the proposal, we built in this, the data hub kind of idea, um, the first version. So the first instances of countries pushing data through to the central database all came from the feedback mechanism. So we had a very specific set of countries. Um, so I think we originally piloted in two countries for the feedback mechanism. Then we got some funding to scale to another five. So that gave us a, a kind of manageable sort of scale to deal with the first two, get it working. Then we moved on to the the next sort of five in turn. And in each instance, we did training with, with the team. We ran through how it all works. You know, we worked through the setup. We did the design workshops with them, um, both for the survey tool and for, for the dashboarding and the, the reporting. But what we were able to show was, because we were using a standard survey for this, we could build a standard reporting template. And so that helped a lot with, you know, we built elements of the dashboard and the reporting that fitted with Oxfam's standard, say like SITREP reporting or monthly reporting. So there is a page for each country that replicates what they just need to copy and paste into a, a monthly report. Um, so it was about just trying to, to simplify existing processes as much as possible. And then once countries had done it with the feedback mechanism, they could then start doing it with things like activity tracking. Um, yes, and, and other elements. Hopefully that answers the question. Sorry, you were mute. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, anyone online? I mean, sort of feel free to come off mute if you want to ask anything or drop it in the chat window. I think you're good to go. Uh, okay. Wait, sorry. One, uh, one last question from here, from Terre des Zones. <laughs> thank you for the presentation, Richard. Uh, my question is about first, um, if I understood what you said, that um, uh, the data that is managed uh, um, uh, through the hub is the CFRM data. Is there any other? Program, program related data, for example, data around uh, gender justice programs, uh, sexual reproductive health uh, uh, thematic issues, or more like a bit sensitive issue. And uh, second question would be, um, you, you mentioned that, um, the, uh, that you're working with a team uh, on this and that uh, the size was recently reduced. How many people are, do work on, on this project? and what type of skills competency do you have in the team thank you okay. so um on the the team size so we are currently um due to a couple of well, we've got a colleague on maternity leave and, and someone who has recently left so currently we have two people in the kind of the main piece of our team our digital and program team and then we have two people um kind of aligned to us in our humanitarian team. So within Oxfam, we have humanitarian support personnel. So they're the ones who are, you know, able to deploy at kind of 24 hours notice to any response. Um, so we have two people in that team who we work very closely with, who I say, to my mind, are part of our team. Currently, there's two others of us, myself and Melton, who's based in the Philippines. Um, and our HSPs, are, we have one in Indonesia, one in Pakistan. And then we have kind of two gaps at the moment. Um, previously, they were UK based, but 
Um, that's just because of kind of where we ended up recruiting people from. Um, because we work with different countries, it doesn't kind of really matter where where we are based. Um, and most, in fact, all of our team have come from a program background. So I spent eight years or so working in supply and logistics um, and working with, human, you know, in-country programs and, and in responses. Um, and so we've all come from that program side um, and have tended to be program sort of people with some technical knowledge or an interest in tools. And that's kind of why we've ended up where we are. Um, so my colleague, Melissa, was a meal officer, um, a meal advisor, and then kind of came across to the digital team. Um, so our skills, as say, it's a mixture of we are, we know enough about the technology to talk with the really techie people. And we know enough about program to talk with the program team. So we, we kind of act almost as that translator quite often um, between kind of program needs and uh, kind of what IT want to do. Um, in terms of the types of data we've had going into the data hub. So one thing we are very clear on is, so for example, with the feedback data, it is general feedback, it is not, um, and particularly from an Oxfam perspective here over the last few years, we don't put safeguarding information into this system or fraud data. We have separate systems for managing that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I'm currently doing some work with our Gaza team, um, or in fact, a multi-country program between Gaza, Iraq, and Yemen on gender justice, um, where they're going to be doing this, the kind of activity tracking. So using Survey CTO, Power BI, um, and linking it with their log frames. So we've got um, a sort of relatively simple setup of taking their log frames, their activity lists, linking that with Survey CTO. And so as the data comes in, you know, on a monthly basis to say, you know, we've delivered, I don't know, partners, mostly this is saying we've delivered, you know, these five activities, we can directly link it in Power BI back to their, you know, the outputs, outcomes and, and the different indicators. So we, we can get that type of data in through as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, equally, obviously, I'll sort of post this session if anyone has any follow up questions or, or is interested in any more detail. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to catch up with people after as well and figure out with, with Maeve how to share contact details. Okay. Great. No more questions from the room, anyways, <laughs> for the moment. So, so perhaps, and, and this kind of case that he might answer a few more questions as well. So I say we were, we wanted to work with the country program, really looking at how do we, how can we work with the program to really using our data know, the fundamental question was, how do we know if a program is working well? That's basically where this all started from. Um, you know, as I show, we have lots of pieces of data kind of all over the shop um, in different systems. And we want to bring that to a central point and say, how can we measure? How can we show that we're progressing or falling back, you know, in, in different areas? So we picked a country and that was our Philippines team. Um, partly so they, they have a very partner led approach, um, which is, you know, where more and more of our work is going. So that was a good kind of starting point. Um, and they're a very keen team. They're very, they're a technologically um, uh, aware team, which definitely made things easier. Um, they had a good meal kind of team, a good meal structure, which was sort of key to all of this. As I said before, it tends to not be the technology, it's the people processes. Um, and we had commitment and, and support from leadership. Um, as well as, I'm not going to forget him, Melton, so one of our team who is based in the Philippines. So he's always able to work closely with this team. And what we did, so we had a third party to sort of help facilitate the discussions. 
and we really just started with a you know kind of what if you know imagine if you you know what's your ideal scenario um for for a kind of system and and your data and hopefully a number of these things look familiar to to those of you you know in this session um and I say it was a mixture of, you know, we want something that donors trust. We want personal data protected. Um, you know, we want real time data. So we don't just want to be, you know, reporting on this uh, or seeing the data six months after it happened, because that's when we have to, you know, meet a, a donor report schedule. So people wanted. So this was the kind of the dream element from from our philippines team and then we started really looking at well what data do we have to know what's going on in our program so we started with a really simple example and that was the ordering of a pizza and this you know everyone can kind of get on board with this whichever part of the organization you work in and what we are interested in is you know who and what is involved as well as where when and how so these kind of in the brackets are the fundamental building blocks um, of our reporting. And then, you know, we can pick up a, a pretty sort of standard example from the program example. So if we're doing a cash distribution, we get those same elements. Who's involved? What are we distributing? You know, how much or how many? Where are we doing it and when? And those were our kind of, okay, we need to think through all of our activities. Um, it's kind of this event, these business activities. Um, and this will help us start to figure out what pieces of data we need to, to standardize and, and really structure well. So that was the kind of starting point. And then, and it's a little bit fuzzy, sorry, this slide, but this idea of data granularity um, starts to matter. So what we wanted was broadly reporting at a project level. So that was what most people wanted. But then you need to kind of figure out, well, we don't just deliver it to project level. You know, we come down to, if we look at identity data, we've got household data, We've got data on individuals and then actually the bit we're interested in is the item given to an individual so you kind of slowly work down to the what are the smallest units here um and then from there if you collect those pieces of data uh, the kind of uh, the black rectangles here um so even in surveys it's particular you know, question and answer, that's our smallest level. If you collect that data, you can then aggregate up to wherever you want in the chain. So our focus was project. But if you get this data right at the start, it's very easy to make this then pull together from multiple projects into a program report. Similarly, you can pull together multiple programs into a country level report, but it all sort of stems from figuring out what are those what are those starting points um and then so where we kind of ultimately got to so this was a, a drawing from our philippines team so i just asked them to draw what they wanted as a as a dashboard um i think quite often i'm all for drawing things and um post-its before you get near any technology um because i think people always have a picture in their head of what they want um and so this was our philippines team's picture of what they they wanted from their data and we figured for reporting knowing whether something was working there were four core elements there's the financials you know what did we say we we would spend and and what have we spent with that money, what have we actually delivered? You know, if it's building latrines or, you know, running training uh, events, then there's the, the tricky bit, the impact, you know, yes, we run the training events, but has anything changed? Um, 
and then the the feedback so it might be that we had money to buy hygiene kits we delivered hygiene kits but you know were the right items in there was the quality good enough so that's then that feedback from from individuals and we figured if we have those four pieces then we can know really whether we're delivering a quality program and i tend to find the further you go down those four bullet points the the trickier the data gets you know we have pretty good systems for for financial data and it's quite easy to collect you know it's easy to know how many kits you've distributed but then it all starts to get a bit trickier around what difference did it make and and say and then getting community feedback um, on quality so it definitely gets more difficult but this was our kind of aim um, and by standardizing and using some common tools we wanted this consistent clean data and allowing it to be shared we're very good at not very good we spend a lot of time pulling data in um as as an organization and as different teams we're not so good at returning that back out to people when we've done the analysis so we also wanted to make sure as well as collecting data from partners that we gave them back the kind of reporting results and last but definitely not least was this privacy by design piece um now our original plan had been to work with a a large scale technology provider to kind of further develop out the data hub so take it to a, a larger scale um and not just for us the idea was to use link it with and this partly comes back to the poll question earlier of what are the systems are out there being used you know could we help some of these vendors set up connectors into a, a data hub type environment so that other organizations could make use of this for various reasons that plan didn't quite work out um and there's a whole other session on why not maybe that's the um uh the jiong kind of fail fest session maybe uh next year for me on what what didn't quite work um but ultimately we kind of we couldn't work with a large provider we had to kind of figure out how to do this ourselves um, because we had made commitments to the country team. So we knew we still wanted to deliver this. It's all taken a bit more time. Um, but I think ultimately it's given us a, a simpler and probably more easily scalable solution. Um, so we've, the main focus has been using existing tools, which was always our plan. So in the Philippines, that's Survey CTO, that's LMMS. It is some use of Excel. Um, and then again, using existing, so we're using Box Drive. It's a standard tool within the organization. So we're making more use of Box for, for dropping data in rather than everything going into our data hub. Um, and we're using it's probably more manual processes than we had originally planned. So getting data out of um, some of these source systems, but actually at this stage, that was a choice by the country team. There is more we could have automated, but the partners and the team actually wanted people involved at a few more steps along the way to check data, to make sure it was, you know, someone hasn't lent on the zero key when they're, you know, saying how many kits we've distributed in the last month so there are elements we could have automated that we haven't and that's just from chatting with our teams but ultimately the data ends up in common and consistent kind of frameworks um some excel some in the data hub um and then we are using power bi still to do the the reporting and it's just a very simple screenshot from our Philippines program, but we can see the different program areas. Uh, so humanitarian and disaster risk reduction, climate change. And we've got the metrics on, you know, delivery versus targets, which is what they were sort of particularly asking for. 
Um, and kind of, so this only really got going probably earlier on this year, ultimately with the team. Um, and in terms of early kind of signs, it's definitely freed up some staff time from the manual processes. There's more time available to spend on the value add. Um, we've improved our data security. Um, so there aren't so many, you know, files being sent around or um, shared. It's more transparent, more, you know, more information available to programs. And it is just a, yeah, it, it's a cleaner sort of quicker way to support teams and have them see what's going on. So, yeah, this is one of those things of we built a hub at the minute. The hub still just has one spoke, which isn't a great hub. We still want to build out connections to some of these other tools like Red Rose and um, maybe even Kobo. But we, we're at the stage where we've kind of taken a slight step back, still delivered for a country team, but it's on a more kind of pragmatic level. Um, what I'll do is we have our next poll. So we'll perhaps run through this poll. So this is kind of for you, you're looking at your priorities for tackling fragmentation, data fragmentation in your context. And then we'll perhaps pause for some, some questions. Yeah, at this point as well. So if you wanna fill in your poll, I'll let Maeve sort it in the room. Brilliant, thanks Rick. So what is the most significant priority for tackling data fragmentation in your context? I'll let you read them. Standardizing data input software, building shared common data standards and language for activities, working with technology providers, working with partners and peers and collaboration, data privacy by design, other. And I think on the online poll I'd added um, no, uh, this is not a significant priority. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as an organization, now the question is, is it a personal answer or, well, it's, it's just to get a, a general tendency. So, okay. but um, if, if you know rather at an organizational level. So, uh, maybe show of hands for standardizing data input software. <laughs> okay, there's a bit of internal debate in organizations uh, where there's more than one people. <laughs> Do you need a bit more time? Or? Well, what we were saying is, for us, uh, the second priority uh, is very, very important, and not only for activities, on, but uh, for, yeah, for indicator, for outcome, and this is a, but, and, and that the software is more of me, so I don't know if uh, you guys remotely can hear that far or not, uh, but there was debate on, um, like, for example, Doctors of the World was saying that it's mostly the second one. Uh, but they consider that the first one is rather a means for, for that second one and not uh, a priority in itself. That makes sense. Yeah. So maybe just um, if you want to answer. So who wants, uh, who for whom would it be the second one? Okay, we have three, well, four organizations with, uh, yeah, four organizations on the second one. Yeah, do it a bit. <laughs> it's a priority, but that doesn't mean it's done that much. Okay. Uh, any organization not having answered? All right. Okay. Um, and on the remote side, what's it like? Marion, 
What's it like on the remote side? Uh, the remote side is like two out of ten for the first one. So I don't play my software. Four out of ten for the second one. Zero for working with tech providers. Uh, four out of ten for working with partners and peers on collaborations. And the rest is all the other Okay. <laughs> so I'll just share those results out for those online. But I think, yeah, for me, there's a there's definitely a difference between what's the priority and what is actually happening. So there's no, those two don't always uh, follow. Um, and I think some of these bits are interesting. So the next, just the last couple of slides I've got are around some of the lessons learned from our side and I think a lot of this speaks to that around you know the common standards and language and working with others you know these aren't focused on technology you know it, it's more around the people side but um are there any questions from anyone online or or in the room before I sort of as I say cover some of our lessons learned Mm, it doesn't look like it from the room at this stage. Okay. Um, so I say it's just kind of really last few slides on this. Um, let's say the main takeaways we've had with all of all of the projects we've worked on with different technologies is, and I will just repeat it: the technology is the easy bit. There needs to be an emphasis on kind of human stories and processes. Um, and kind of meeting people as much as possible where they are. So for the feedback mechanism, we tried as much as possible to fit to existing processes and use technology when, where it can help and as an enabler, but we're not trying to fundamentally change, say, the entry points for this. Um, you know, it's also necessary to understand capacities and that's both you know kind of skills but also just you know who is there who is available to work on particular things you can build the best system in the world but if there's no one actually there to use it or to maintain it um you're gonna have issues um i appreciate the next one around language is um ironic since i'm the one here having to you know, you're having to listen to me speak in English and I can't deliver this in French, unfortunately, but the language, and even within Oxfam, if I start talking about, you know, we all love acronyms. And in Oxfam, I spend a lot of time working on VWW and RRR, which even two years ago didn't make any sense to me. And that's value in women's work and rights, resilience and response. So these we use these acronyms, and particularly then if we're talking with partners, you know, maybe gender justice is the term that's common to us, but we just need to be aware of that as we're having these discussions. Um, and then it's that the mixture of the standardization and the flexibility. So um, as I say, if we can find, so with our survey bank, I think one of the issues one of the reasons it never quite took off is everybody sees their program, their context as unique and special. And we need, you know, in Iraq, we need a different way of doing it than uh, Zambia, for example. Whereas actually when you get down to it, and it's one of the reasons that kind of the business activity modeling is, is quite good. When you get down to the who, what, where, how, when, why the fundamentals are pretty much the same so if you can get these survey tools um or your whatever your data collection is if you can standardize 80 percent you've gone a huge way to to then actually being able to improve your reporting um and simplify the processes for a lot of people and then you've still got that flexibility to add in you know some local context um, we always have to be aware of the donor requirements. Um, just, yeah, 
they're always there, um, but it's good to know about them in advance when you start developing any of these reports or tools. It's really key to get the buy-in from the stakeholders. Again, we very rarely do kind of top-down um, work in our team, just because we don't tend to find it works that well. Um, and then just this last one around the top down and bottom up kind of buy-in and support. I think it works at different levels. It's organizationally that we have the kind of head office down to kind of country program, but also just within a program. You know, you go from your country director to your, you know, meal officer or, you know, could be someone working in a partner. You need to find that balance, you know, between, um, who has the influence but who really understands who is this going to make a difference for and i think we tend to tend to find any of these systems and solutions or you know data standardization those who are working with the data and doing this work day to day they get it they fully buy into the process and it's a very easy sell the further you go up the chain i've tended to find it gets a little bit more difficult um and partly because people see these reports. So, you know, they get the, the monthly report, the quarterly report. And then sometimes I think there's an assumption that this data just exists and it was easily presented. And there's not necessarily an understanding of how much work has gone into collecting, cleaning, aggregating for the final presentation. So that's, um, yeah, so around the people, it's around telling those stories and having people understand where it comes in. On the technology side, we as much as possible try and go with this, you know, buy an existing solution, don't build one, or use open source. You know, again, if it's kind of good quality and is well supported, that's great. Um, we did, as I say, a tiny bit of development for our data hub, but it really was small. Um, the biggest thing is to invest in your data cleaning and underlying maintenance. And usually that's people. Um, they're still key in all this process. Um, being open to different data sources. So we definitely fall into this um, issue sometimes of we assume we have to go out and find the data. We have to go and collect the data. And we're not always great at asking if someone's already done it before, I think, or looking at, you know, publicly available data sets. Um, and that also links just with this, you know, assuming or not alone in the process. Um, you know, the fact that there are people attending this session today, we, we kind of, a lot of us are grappling with the same issues. Um, and someone has probably figured it out somewhere. You know, it's like a very technical thing. I, if I want to do something in Excel, I can't figure out how to do it. I go to YouTube and there's usually a video of someone, you know, six months ago having solved the problem I'm now hitting. So I think that's the other piece is just asking, you know, around and and uh, finding out what's what's there and you know being open to sharing when you have figured out something that's solved a bit of a problem. Um, and then just the last one. So for us, what we're sort of aiming to do is, yeah, trying to figure out what others have done um we're trying to stand work on standardizing more collection across these common tools so we kind of have quite a nice suite of tools we need to get better at standardizing our use of them um we want to expand the use case from the philippines we've got a lot of countries who've seen it and think it's useful um and then that's very kind of oxfam focused looking beyond like i'm quite interested in kind of looking at how can we get better at you know data sharing um we duplicate a lot of work between ourselves even down to registrations of households you know how can we get better at sharing these data connections and, and reducing dependency either on particular tools or just particular organizations and then this you know how do we get to the, the better governance of our data as well you know can we open this up more to communities and get away from let's say us just collecting and holding on to this data and it never 
never getting back outwards. So that is kind of the end of the presentation piece. Um, so very happy to yeah answer any more questions either online uh, in the chat or come off mute or, or there in the room. Um, so I'd be interested to ask our francophone NGO as uh, you are attending, what are their sort of strong reactions if there are some one way or another to Oxfam's presentation? Do you feel very strongly that this is exactly what you would uh, like your, your own organizations to do? Or are there parts that um, you would completely disagree on? Uh, or wouldn't have gone that way on, or that you feel uh, should have had a stronger focus on. Um, so yeah, open to hear how you how you feel about this. Yeah, yeah, please. So we have ac action against hunger. Um, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. So, I mean, when I when I see that, I think that uh, at Action Against Hunger, we're not going, uh, we're not starting from the people and from the, I mean, what you said, the, where the projects are and, and the day-to-day -day person who are actually doing the work. So that's something about us. Um, and I think we are very much pushed into kind of building something that can be global. So having those information to the senior management and HQ first. And this is maybe where we are missing the point. Um, I'm a bit wondering, have you had this thinking at Oxfam already? Did you just decide to put that aside? Uh, I mean, the global uh, consolidation aside because that was the best thing to do? Or, you know, basically how can I convince <laughs> a bit more in, uh, at Asian Against Hunger that uh, I want to go the other way? <laughs> Thank you. Um. Yeah, so I've we've definitely had. Uh, it's not always a, a fixed decision um, on that. So we, you know, I've had from our global humanitarian team and directors. You know, they want a nice dashboard, a nice report on um, to see what's going on across the globe. Um, for me, that we can deliver that. It is a byproduct of. So our focus is always deliver something for the country get it working for the country and if you do that well as it comes to that data granularity piece it should then be relatively easy to aggregate the data up so it's not that i sort of necessarily tell the people in head office that their view is less important and that we can't deliver that but the way we go about it is yes we will deliver you your nice colorful you know global report but first, you know, we need to deliver the country elements first. Um, and so, yeah, for, for me, it's about that. You get what, by delivering, if you start at delivering a global dashboard, you don't necessarily get a good country operation, operational one, um, but I'm happy to deliver a nice global dashboard. But my starting point is always that, finding something that works for a country and generally, particularly on this reporting side, I think if you get it working for one country, it, you know, usually these things tend to be scalable, again, because we tend to do broadly the same things in each of our programs. Um, there is some variation, but mostly it's the same. And I think it, as long as you have some people involved in the design process who do have some of that awareness of the more global side, then it, it can all work nicely. Though I guess there's also the question of uh, local capacity, which can be very different from one country to, to another. Yeah, I, I definitely. And that's, I mean, the, I think the question earlier around, you know, who's building dashboards and reports. Um, you know, there are country teams we've gone to and offered, you know, we've been having a talk about Power BI and they said, oh, you know, we can help do something. And then someone on the call, you know, and then we said, well, does anyone there know how to use it? And someone go, oh, a little bit. Here's what I've done. I'm like, well, oh, that's way beyond anything I can build in Power BI. You know, so again, it's it's figuring out where that um, 
that capacity lies. And um, we're also trying to get better at using, you know, someone in Lebanon to develop the tool to help South Sudan, for example, because they just, they know this, the data better. Um, they know the context more, even though, you know, it's a different country program. Um, and yeah, often they have the better skills than we do. So we have um, a question from Doctors of the World on uh, how the types of profiles of staff in terms of technical skills that you have in country. And if uh, it adds to that, you know, how standard it is your country setups in terms of, um, of HR? Um, yeah, the minute there's definitely it's rarely written into specific contracts and, and job descriptions i think um there are definitely so we as a team spend we work um, a large proportion of the time with our meal teams monitoring evaluation teams and they tend to be the ones who have relatively sort of higher skill levels in these areas around data collection and, and data analysis um you know, some, again, if I use Lebanon as an example, I've got a male colleague there who has a computer science degree, who has, again, is way more qualified, you know, to work on this stuff than I am, who just kind of self-taught and, and learn things as I go. Um, now, that won't have been a requirement, I don't imagine, on the job profile, but it's always handy to have. Um, we have been successful in getting some um, ICT for D type roles recruited in country programs. Um, so we had someone in Ethiopia, we've currently got someone in Somalia in these kind of digital program roles in countries, but they tend to be the, you know, the much larger scale programs where there's a more humanitarian element. There's a lot more data flowing around and therefore it's easier to justify and build into a, a specific um, donor proposal, but they do tend to be quite sort of fixed term, you know, short term contracts. Um, my colleagues at Oxfam US do have some regional posts. So we have someone in uh, Tanzania, kind of serving the, the Horn in East Africa and uh, someone in Senegal supporting the West Africa region um, with these kind of types of initiative and, and tools. And it definitely helps having a kind of presence within the region um, for us. But it's, yeah, I think we still haven't got anything formal written in through HR. What I will say is the skills of those applying for jobs now compared with 10 years ago, uh, it we tend to find quite a big step up, but just through naturally more people are just aware and are using these types of technology irrespective of Oxfam. Yeah, another question from Doctors of the World. Yeah. Hi. One second. <laughs> Hello. So, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, so, I have a few questions with regards to the prerequisite in slide 25. Uh, first of all, thank you. Yeah, also, doctors of the world, we also intend to find the right balance between standardization and flexibilities because it's very important to. Well, to simplify the way the sales prepares the data, but in the meantime, being enough standardized in order to well, ease the preparation process. Uh, I was quite impressed because you said um, you intend to have like 80% standardization for your data. So to me, it's a big question with regards to how much effort you put in uh, towards this standardization, how much time and resources you put in uh, making this a standard uh, ground. Uh, also, for example, yeah, because before you know reaching this target, I mean, you probably, it, it was a very big effort, I guess, for finding the right languages, 
and like putting everybody together to to have this uh, well standardization basically. So that's my first question. And and second question, uh, you in slide twenty five you say also by informed stakeholders. So my second question would be. Um, well, in your way, how do you get this, uh, I mean, in your best way, how do you get this buying from stakeholders? Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. So um, maybe I need to clarify that, that kind of 80% or so, that's definitely still a target for us. So we have not reached that. So we are definitely, we haven't standardized anyway, you know, our data collection, but that's a kind of personal I think if we can get to, let's say for, if you take an example of cash um, post-distribution monitoring, if we can get to a point where 80%, like you have a core PDM that is consistent and about 80% of the questions are the same, I think that's, you know, more than good enough. We are not there at the moment. Um, and it is something we want to push on again more and I think it then links to that second part around the, the influencing and getting the buy-in, which we haven't always done. Um, and for me, it's about telling the stories and you have to, it has to benefit each person somewhere along the line. Unfortunately, you know, it comes down to human nature and people will do things if it makes their life easier or better somewhere along the way. Um, so, for example, um, in our Iraq program, when we implemented the feedback mechanism and we scaled it across the country, for the meal officer there, each quarter he had to produce, you know, stats on on the amount of feedback received, and that was prior to us coming in and, and doing anything different with digital tools, and that used to be about a two week process um, of requesting data from the different field offices, requesting again, it coming in through various Excel sheets. They had to be checked, aggregated, and then reports generated and charts. And it roughly took about two weeks for him. Um, with the way we've now got it with Survey CTO and the Data Hub and Power BI, that is about, I think in total, two hours process for that person to just check it all looks okay, review it and actually spend a bit of time doing some analysis on what does this actually mean for us. Um, and I think those kinds of story, obviously it's is very easy for that person to go, you know, someone in that position, here's the benefit for you. You know, it's two hours work instead of two weeks work of chasing people and, and messing around with Excel. Um, but as you go further up the chain, it's then telling the story of where you're now getting, you know, better quality, more accurate data. Your team can spend more time on the, the as I say, the value added work of actually doing the analysis rather than just sorting through Excel sheets. Um, there's also a nice angle on you generally with this stuff it's an easy sell with donors. So donors like, you know, good reporting, they like clear reporting. Um, and if you can show that you've got systems and, and processes in place, that gets them on side, which is then helps the sell, I think, with more senior managers, you know, who are interested in the, the donor funding coming through. But uh, yeah, I've yet to find a, a perfect solution every time to get the buy-in. Like I say, we've had instances where I've seen a few years ago, you know, my manager, I think, right, we've cracked it, walk into a session with um, very senior management. They're gonna love this, walk out and go, no, they didn't get it. Um, and we have to kind of start again with how we tell the story. Um, so it is, and say some of these lessons learned, it's, we know we need to do this, we aren't doing it ourselves yet, but we kind of, we're trying our best. And again, that's why for me, it's useful coming to these sessions because there's other people out there who can give me examples of when they've done it better than we have. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, do we have any last one or two questions? So we have solidarity running over. Um, hi again. Um, the last points that you were making on data sharing and uh, the fact that we kind of keep our data to ourselves uh, really uh, speaks to my uh, mind and heart. Um, I don't see any way forward. And so I was wondering if between, because we are all kind of in, part, in consortium projects together, um, but we see that even in consortium, it, it is difficult to kind of get to share that data. Um, has, has, there any, has there been any good practices um, on Oxfam or any like success stories um, with partners? Because the alternative for me would be a kind of a donor based or donor constraint. And I, I'm not sure I like that idea much, uh, much better. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think so is a good example. Um, the, the, the dashboard I, I showed at one point from, from Indonesia. So that Palu response for me was a really, it was a great example of, we had someone, one of our team is based in, in Indonesia and, and was there to, to work with the team on it. Probably 80, 90% of the program delivery was with local partners. And actually the dashboard that, that we generated and used was freely, it was pretty sure publicly available. So anyone with that URL was able to see. So that was shared. I mean, our own teams found it very useful. It was shared with partners. So the partners themselves could just access that web link and, and see what was going on. Pretty certainly it was shared with the donors as well. So they could see what was happening kind of close to real time, which uh, I know there are differing views on, on necessarily going quite that far. Um, we spend a lot of time writing the narratives around this reporting. Um, and then there's actually one thing I will also add around the, something I forgot to mention earlier, this distinction between the country level reporting and global. The other reason for focusing on country for me is the further away you get from from the where this where your operation is happening and the data is being collected, you lose the context and, and the narrative that goes with it. So if you have a report that shows, you know, I don't know, suddenly at a particular point in time, nothing happened for two months. There was no delivery, there was no what have you. If you're sat in HQ, that might look like a problem. If you're in country, you know that it was the rainy season and the roads were impassable, you couldn't get there. So you see that on the chart and you can immediately disregard it. You know why and you carry on. You didn't expect anything to happen. But again, the further you get away, just having numbers on a, a page, um, you can lose that feel for, for exactly what it means. And in an ideal world, someone would look at that chart, perhaps see some data that didn't look good, you know, in the nicest sense, but, um, and go and ask a question. Doesn't always work that way. People will look, make a judgment, make a decision in their mind and carry on. So that's another reason, just, sorry, kind of going back a couple of questions, but why for me, the focus is on, on country and kind of program and project. Um, and for the sharing, yeah, I think, there is also sometimes we have a reluctance to share our data and our reporting because, I don't know, I think quite often we assume our own data and reporting is perhaps not as good as others. Um, there's an assumption we know all the caveats, we know all the things that are wrong with our own data, and we're sometimes worried about sharing that with others. But then equally, we assume everyone else's is done well and good without kind of figuring they've probably got all the same issues. Um, so um, yeah, we're not there yet. We've got some good examples um, and we would like to do more of it, but it's definitely a, an organizational change. We spent a lot of years gathering everything in and holding it close to us and it, it will take time to push it back out again.
Thank you, Rick. Um, I think we can leave it at that for, for today if there are no follow-up questions. So thanks a million for um, your presentation. I think um, there's a lot of interesting aspects that will resonate in different ways, or as we say in French, faire des petits. Uh, so um, thank you um, a million times for that. Um, on a more general level, just to mention that um, on all of the follow-up exchange days, we'll also have other feedback from uh, NGOs, Anglophone NGOs in particular. And on the 8th of February, which will be the next exchange day in particular, we'll have a feedback session from Water Aid, who is also, I think, um, at the, this presentation, um, so that everybody has it on their radar. So I'll share, as, as Rick, you seemed okay with that, I'll share Rick's contact details uh, with the participants of today um, in case anybody wants to, to reach out. And um, yeah, uh, thanks again, Rick. And looking forward, I, I noted uh, the suggestion of you being at uh, the GONG Fail Fest uh, next year. So we already have the dates of the GONG. Um, in October, so I'll already uh, note down that uh, the question of uh, technology and NGOs and and uh, how how NGOs should or can interact with technology providers uh, will be a potential fail fest uh, uh, element. So we'll continue with our exchange day uh, with workshops around data quality. And um, hope to see you uh, in person, Rick, at some point in the coming year. And thanks again. And thanks to all our participants, of course, and see you at four for the next session that will be uh, remote uh, today. Okay, bye bye, everyone. <laughs> and Thank thanks. You. Good luck with the rest of the day. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>